Well today we're on the Triftgletscher in the Swiss Alps and the topic of this video clip uh, is looking at sediment characteristics and seeing what sediments can tell us about their transport and depositional history. Now we've come to this glacier uh, predominantly so we can look at uh, surface sediments because they may have an interesting transport history. They could have been transported at the bed of the glacier uh, or they could be surface derived from adjacent slopes etc. And if I just zoom in, you'll see that uh, Sarah and Rachel have collected a selection of supraglacial surface-derived uh, clasts of varying shapes and sizes. We just picked up a random sample and uh, we're going to see what we can uh, tell from these and what sort of techniques are available to us. Okay, Rachel's holding up a class, a fairly large class here. Um, what's the parameter we could have a look at on this class, Sarah and Rachel? Uh, but we could look at our three different axes, our A, B and C axis. Um, a is measured the longest points this way. So that's the long axis. Yes, the long yeah. axis. Your intermediate axis is a B axis, which is across there at the widest point. At right um, angles. At right angles. Yep. And your shortest axis is almost through the centre of the glass. Mm -hmm. it's sort of from there to there. Okay, and if we've got that A, B, C, we can uh, classify those different class into different shapes. Uh, the, the, the Zing classification is well known. That classifies into spheres, rods, blades and discs according to the relative measurements of A, B and C axes. Okay, another uh, parameter we can look at is the roundness of our particles. Again, as with all these techniques, this isn't exclusive to glacial environments, um, but we're on a glacier, so we're going to make the most of it. Uh, what, what does the roundness tell us about these particles? Um, again, as same with particle shape, it can um, be used to reconstruct the history of um, transport through a glacial system. Yeah, transport and deposition are uh, particularly useful for trying to differentiate the basal class from other, other classes. Clearly the basal environment is, is, is high pressure, a, a large degree of geomorphic activity. Uh, and we can also differentiate material that may have been reworked by fluvioglacial activity. Obviously glaciers have dynamic rivers running within them and, and from them uh, and that can modify and rework debris uh, to a fairly high degree. So I'm just going to zoom in on the chart that Sarah's holding up, or rather walking. Um, and here we've got powers round this classification. Uh, hopefully you can see that. And we would classify our class on a subjective basis according to whether they're very angular, angular, subangular, subrounded, rounded, well rounded. Uh, so for example, something that's rounded or well rounded may have experienced intensive fluvioglacial activity, for example. Something that's rather more towards the angular side of the scale uh, may indica indicate more of a supraglacial origin. Um, so it is subjective, but a very useful means of classifying and, uh, and again trying to pin down the detailed uh, depositional and transport history of these class, and that can help us interpret landform genesis as well. Um, and a top tip for you in our uh, series of top tips, we'll combine this with the discussion of particle shape. Sarah has laminated uh, a photocopy of the powers round this scale from a textbook. Uh, and the textbook we're using today, excellent book for glacial environments, uh, field techniques in glaciology and glacial geomorphology, Hubbard and Glasser. Uh, obviously it's, it's dedicated to glacial environments, uh, but there's some excellent generic information uh, at the start of the book on preparation for field work. Uh, as well. So we'd recommend that if you're coming to glacial environments and of course the general hints and tips for non-glacial environments. So there you go, laminating is cheap and quick and easy and it means you're not uh, having to worry about getting things wet. Um, so a, a useful tip for you there. Of course we can make all these measurements in non-glacial settings. We could look at uh, rock debris, avalanche deposits, etc., uh, and try and assess the transport and, and history uh, of those features. So the techniques we're describing today are not exclusive to glacial environments, but uh, certainly we can tell a good deal about 
transport pathways and uh, transport history from these very simple measurements.